much, Ross, for the invitation, and thank all of you for for hosting me here. I've had a great time so far. I've uh, seen lots of really cool stuff, so it really has been very, very nice uh, to be here. So what I would like to perhaps do is I've seen quite a lot of what you do, and I've seen a lot about your uh, ski institute, which has been great. probably should tell you something very, very brief about where I come from, because sort of we don't really have this sort of interdisciplinary institute where we work in. We're sort of more in a traditional computer science department, which actually for bizarre reasons is called Department of Computing, which I, I hate as a name for a computer science department. But um, for some reason that has been for, for a long time. We are sort of uh, 55 academics, sort of 24 full professors. The rest are sort of associate and assistant professors. Uh, so we are one of the sort of, in the UK, one of the largest uh, computer science departments. And we have a lot of different research themes, which uh, you're probably not that interested in. Sort of the, the research theme I work in is sort of visual information processing. And we have a couple of different groups like you have here. One is sort of more... Um, HCI type intelligent behavior understanding, which does a lot of computer vision for, uh, for example, facial interpretation and tracking of, uh, of people. We have a big robot vision group. Um, and then some of you might know uh, some of my colleagues who work more on the medical robotics side, which also do some medical imaging, but mostly focus on image-guided interventions, robotics, sensor networks, and then uh, the biomedical image analysis group um, which sort of at the moment we're probably around 25, 28 people uh, currently. So what I decided today is perhaps uh, show you uh, a snapshot of what we've been doing and one particular theme we've been sort of following over the last couple of years is actually less using sort of things like image registration which, or less developing things like image registration but more using them in the context of uh, medical imaging, but combining them with, for example, some uh, recent developments in, in um, machine learning, for example. So if you look at what has transformed the field of computer vision in the last 10 years, perhaps the most, it's sort of the introduction of machine learning as a way of, of doing things very fast, but also very reliably, without really uh, formulating too much an ad hoc algorithm. So... If you think about uh, the traditional tasks in computer vision, which are now solved with machine learning, object detection, object segmentation, tracking, the great thing is if you do this in, in, in medical imaging, you only need to change one word. You just replace object with organ and you're, you're, in, the right, uh, you're in the right ballpark. But actually, there's much more to uh, machine learning and medical imaging than, than just doing the sort of traditional tasks. There's a lot of interest in, for example, developing computer-aided diagnosis solutions, really, uh, which tell you something uh, useful you wouldn't otherwise know. Uh, analysis of functional images, uh, fMRI, for example, biomarker discovery, looking at, for example, associations between genes and images. So there's a lot of really challenging tasks for machine learning and medical imaging. But if you look at that, there are also quite a lot of differences between what people do in computer vision in terms of machine learning and what we do in, in, uh, in medical imaging. And sort of one of the fundamental problems we typically have is that our data has a higher dimensionality than what you typically have in vision. So we have often 3D, 4D, even 5D, or you know, people in cardiac imaging call their, often their data set 7D because they have sort of time-varying velocity and so on. So the number of voxels and the number of features you can extract are really, really huge. But at the same time, when you talk to somebody in vision, they often say, well, I have a large data set, I have 10, 20 million images. And that sounds pretty large. When we talk about large data sets, and some of you work, for example, on ADNI, we feel quite happy and pr quite proud of We can say, we actually use 800 images. You know, that's, that sounds a lot. But actually, that means you have actually very little data to learn from. You have a very high dimensional problem, very little data to learn from. The other thing is our training data is really expensive because if you get uh, experts to do annotations, that's very expensive. And also, our training data is often imperfect. So if you use, for example, data like in ADNI, you often use their scores, whether they're classified as Alzheimer's or normals. 
as a sort of ground truth. And actually, if you really look into that, you might discover that in some cases there are errors in the ground truth because, of course, um, the clinician might not do a perfect scoring as well. So I want to, despite all these disadvantages, show you three different applications where medical imaging can actually be very, very useful in the context of extracting information from medical images. And I thought about three different applications. And the first one I want to show you is what we call intelligent imaging. Uh, and sort of that's more of a buzzword because we have a sort of, in the U uh, here in the US, you have this NAMIC uh, consortium which focuses on, on medical imaging. We have in the UK something in, uh, equivalent which focuses on, on a topic called intelligent imaging. And that tries to combine image acquisition with, um, with image analysis in a, in a clever way. So let me first talk about this. So I guess all of you have sort of seen how an MR scanner looks like. Uh, you can get them in this very nice green color. You can put very small people in it. And you can put very large people into it. And the great thing is if you don't like the color, you can also order them apparently in different <laughs> colors. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's quite flexible. It's, it's a quite expensive thing, but uh, okay. So, but the, the, the key thing about MR, if for those of you who know a bit about how MR imaging works, is actually the inherent data collection process is relatively slow. And that's fine if you, for example, look at the brain, you put the patient uh, in the scanner, you ask them to lie still for 10 minutes or so, and that's fine. But there are a lot of things where, uh, where you can't effectively force the object to be static. So if you look at the heart, of course, you, uh, the heart contracts, it, you have respiratory motion. If you look at a subject like a fetus inside the mother, of course, they don't really follow any instructions you give them. So you really need to think about, is there a way of doing the data acquisition in a more clever way? And I want to show you a particular example. The first one is actually not so much using machine learning, but it shows you what you can do. So I don't know if, if, if you have ever seen how fetal MRI looks like. If I, if I show you this, hopefully this movie will play. This is the challenge in, in, in fetal MRI is that you have a subject which uh, involuntarily moves, uh, and of course you also have the mother breathing. But nevertheless, if you use a very fast, uh, very advanced sort of real-time imaging techniques, you can generate these fascinating pictures which show uh, the fetus inside the mother. And, and of course, if you have been in an MR scanner, you know how noisy these MR scanners are. They're incredibly noisy. And a normal subject would probably wear um, uh, earplugs or um, uh, other things. So uh, that's not possible here. So you get these really fascinating images, which you uh, generate by using these uh, single shot uh, techniques, which are effectively 2D acquisitions in real time, which freeze the motion. But then you come and realize, if you give them um, to somebody to analyze, if you stack them back together, there's a problem. Uh, you know, while they look in one plane very nice, uh, if you stack them into a volume, you see that you have all this motion corrupting the volume because the object is, of course, moving during the acquisition. So one of the initial problems we worked on is, is, is there a way of using image analysis to actually get rid of this, this motion? And I'll show you a fairly old algorithm now, which actually does this in a pretty uh, reliable way. So the idea which we had is, what we do is we take a lot of these data, where we basically acquire these loops of single slices, which are fast enough to freeze the motion, but they're inconsistent. So I get this stack of slices. Each slice is motion free, but the stack might be motion corrupted. And then I can get, actually, I can acquire these stack in different orientations, and uh, I acquire them in lots of different um, uh, orientations. And then the first thing I can do is I can actually take all these volumes which are motion corrupted, and I can re align them to one single reference uh, stack. So I might choose, for example, the first stack as a reference frag stack. I uh, register all my stacks to that first stack using a very simple rigid registration, and I effectively generate this this uh, average volume where the slices are now not perfectly registered. But what I can do is actually I can use this to actually reconstruct a motion corrupted volume which is an average of all these different 
uh, stacks. So I can actually generate perhaps what looks like a fairly blurry um, 3D volume of the, of the fetal brain, which shows me roughly the anatomy, but has lots of motion artifacts. Um, so the next step, what I can do is I can actually take each individual slice and now say, well, I know the brain is rigid. So if the subject moves, the only thing which can happen is a rigid transformation. I can now basically say, OK, now I can take every single slice and I can re-register that slice to my hypothetical volume. And if I do this, I can actually reorient the slices uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular fashion so that they best fit the volume. And of course, if I do this once, I might not get the right solution because the initial volume I'm registering to is also a bit motion corrupted. So I'm basically now starting to form a new volume. Um, I can basically go back to my 3D reconstruction step and I can generate a new volume and repeat the process by re-registering the slices. So that's actually a fairly nice way which was proposed by different groups, by our group and also by Colin Studholm's group, um, to actually basically remove these motion artifacts from a moving object. So what you get at the end of the day is you go from this initial motion-corrupted volume to a motion-free volume, which also has higher signal uh, signal to noise and contrast to noise ratio, simply because effectively I've imaged the object in this different stack. So I've I've got effectively, I can effectively do super resolution because I have more than one sample for, um, for, the, different, uh, for the different parts of the anatomy. So that's a fairly simple idea of simply using registration for um, effectively allowing you to reconstruct motion or reconstruct a, a, an, an image volume despite motion. So I want to show you another example which uses more, goes more into the machine learning direction, and which tries to basically speed up uh, the acquisition of, uh, of moving objects, like, for example, images of the heart. And I, I'm not sure how many of you know how, an MR, how the basic principle of an MR scanner works, but what you're really doing is when you're acquiring an M MR image, you're acquiring data in this domain called the, the case space which is effectively a Fourier transform of the image. So what you're do, doing is you're collecting lines in this case space. Collecting a line is relatively quick, but going from one line to the other takes relatively a lot of time. And then if you have collected the Fourier transform of the image, you can simply do the, the inverse Fourier transform to go back to your spatial reconstruction of the image. So the reconstruction is quite simple. Now, if you have an image like the heart, you, of course, have motion, so what you do is you want to actually generate a dynamic image of the heart. So you keep on repeating this process. You collect this data for different points in the cardiac cycle, and you then basically can reconstruct different time points in this dynamic image. Okay, so this is relatively slow because you have to collect the same information over and over again, but the object is actually only moving in a, in a certain way. So we're always looking at the same object, just in a slightly deformed version. So one trick of, of making the image acquisition faster is to do something fairly naive. I'm basically saying I'm not collecting every information in this case space. I'm just going to skip a few lines. And I'm basically only collecting some partial information of the Fourier representation of the object. And I basically pretend that the rest of the information is zero. If I reconstruct an image from this, you get this sort of um, ghosted or undersamp or a sort of blurry looking image, or perhaps even, even better sort of if I show you this as a movie. So the top case is basically full sampling of case space. So it means everything is white. That means I know the value at every point in this case space, and I can reconstruct a perfect image, or that, as good as it gets in, in, uh, in MR. So the easy way of accelerating this is basically saying, OK, I'm only going to acquire every fourth data point, and I'm going to do this in a random fashion. So I'm going to, going to acquire these random lines, and you see that the middle of the image I always acquire, or the middle of this case space I always acquire, because these are the low frequencies in case space. So that's actually uh, the most important bit of information, so I should always acquire that. But the image you reconstruct looks pretty grotty. If you want to process that, 
you're making your life even harder than with what you started off with. So how, and the reason why you get this basic, this, this poor looking image is because you're vi violating Nyquist sampling theorem. You're basically undersampling your data. So how can you actually try to solve this problem? Um, and I know some of you guys uh, work on this as well. So I saw yesterday uh, a very nice uh, piece of work on, on a very similar related idea, um, which basically uses sparsity. So the idea of sparsity is that most images you can compress them without losing information in a quite efficient way. So a standard idea is if you use JPEG compression, a lossy JPEG, JPEG compression, you can actually get away with compressing the image quite well without degrading it too much. So this, the assumption that, uh, that sparsity makes is that if you have these artifacts like aliasing is that this assumption of sparsity breaks down. So the idea of sparsity is I take my image data, I apply some sparsifying transform, and after the sparsifying transform, some of the coefficients are non-zero, but most of the coefficients are zero. And the standard way you normally do this is by using the wavelet transform. So if you do a wavelet transform, uh, you can retain a small number of coefficients, set all the other ones to zero, and you don't lose much in, the, in terms of the image. Now, if your image is uh, aliased or um, corrupted, then it turns out that in practice, the assumption of sparsity breaks down or is harder to satisfy. So you see that this data set, which is uh, undersampled and therefore aliased, is not as sparse as the original data set. Uh, and I guess the key thing is that this sparsity is especially useful for dynamic images. So in, in MR imaging, people are very familiar with this formulation. It's called a compressed sensing uh, uh, formulation. Also outside uh, MR imaging, compressed sensing is, is, is a quite uh, uh, widely used topic. So in our case, the way we deal with compressed sensing for MR reconstruction is that we assume we have some undersampled uh, case-based data and the Fourier uh, operator. And what we look for is a solution uh, to the full case space that is consistent with the data we've actually collected from case space. So remember, we have only collected a part of case space, uh, but that part of case space we want to actually uh, keep because we know that's really what we have measured. So we want to make sure that the, the case space data we have collected is actually valid. But at the same time, if we apply a sparsifying transform, we want to minimize the L0 or the L1 norm of, uh, of the data after the sparsifying transform. So this can be formulated as an optimization problem, and we can solve that. We can basically uh, use this. And I guess the only thing is, which people often don't really realize, which is quite important, is we need to actually make sure that the sparsifying transform, the sparsest representation, actually really corresponds to the solution we have. So what we typically have is we start off with some some initial alias solution here, and what we force it, we force it to find the, the nearest local minimum in the hope that actually that, by minimizing the sparsity of this, that, actu that actually corresponds to the image we want to reconstruct. So we basically uh, do this minimization and find this. So actually, as I said before, this is not, not entirely new. So people have used lots of different, uh, way, uh, different transforms for doing the sparsity. Probably the most widely used one is a wavelet transform, but there are other transform, temporal Fourier transforms. And you'll see also that all these MR formulations have typically a, a fancy name uh, uh, associated with them. But there are some problems with these. For example, the Fourier transform has no localization in time. And in general, the transformation is not specific to the data you uh, have actually acquired. So we started off using an idea from uh, uh, Bresla and Ravi Shankar, which they proposed a while ago, and we adopted it to, to work with dynamic data. And the idea here is that actually we use a dictionary representation uh, to actually find out what's the sparsest representation of the image. So what we do is we effectively take our data we build a dictionary, so we basically take a patch-based representation of the image. We build a dictionary, uh, and then we try to use that dictionary to code our image. 
And that actually often has problems uh, coding the, the aliasing. And then, uh, so we often get uh, in this step, we remove some of the aliasing, we make it consistent with a, uh, with a case-based data, and then we keep on building a new dictionary. So the dictionary we learn is actually not offline learned, but it's learned online on the corrupted data. And so the, the basic idea of this is you have this different step. So in the first step, you take your 3D patches. So 3D is now 2D plus time. Uh, so we take these patches here. We uh, simply stack them into a long vector. Then we try to find this dictionary, which yells a sparse representation. Uh, and there are lots of different algorithms for doing this. For example, I think the most commonly used algorithm is probably the KSVD algorithm, which will spit out a dictionary like this. So um, it's an overcomplete dictionary. And if you look at it, so you see it moving here because effectively it's a 3D dictionary, so it's 2D plus time. So we're just slicing through the different elements of the dictionary in time. And you see that they have some degree of similarity to what probably a sort of uh, a Haar wavelet basis would representation would, would look like. Uh, so it's, it's learned from the data. Um, yeah. And, um, and after we have learned it from the data, we can then do the sparse coding uh, using this dictionary. So we basically extract a patch, we sparse code that, and we try to minimize the difference between these. So this is the actual coding step. And in this coding step, you're effectively excluding some bit of the aliasing because the representation you have learned is sparse and is not able to really represent this uh, aliasing very well. And the next step, which is probably quite important, is that, as I said before, we have measured some bit of, of k-space. So we know some of these lines in k-space. If we have sparse coded our image, we can now apply a Fourier transform, go back into k-space. And then we can actually basically fill the missing bits of k-space. But we can also um, basically replace the measured bits of k-space with our estimate, depending on how noisy the measurements are in k-space. So, for example, if I would basically, if I don't know the measurement in k-space, I replace it with my uh, Fourier transformed version of the, of the reconstructed image. Uh, if, it's, if I have measured that bit of k-space, I basically have a factor here which tells me how much do I trust my measurements in k-space, and if I trust it a lot, then I will just basically not touch it. If I think my k-space measurement might be noisy, I'm going to basically average my k-space measurement with uh, what I sort of hypothesized. What we've also added to this is to try to make the sparsity even, even more prominent because we're looking, uh, we're working with this dynamic data. And this is, by the way, this is... Uh, uh, will be presented at, uh, at, at Mika in a, in a couple of weeks in Nice, is to actually add a temporal gradient sparsity term to actually make sure that we, we know that the sequence we have in time, our temporal gradient should be actually relatively sparse because the object we're looking at is deforming slowly in time. So if you actually look at this, so if you, I mean, you're probably all familiar with a total variational concept. If we, if we for example, compute... Uh, the, uh, the gradient of the image in all three dimensions, we get something, so if we take our signal, we compute the gradient in all three dimensions, you get a fairly, a fairly sparse representation of the image, but actually, or a fairly sparse uh, transform. But if you actually look only at the temporal gradients, you basically see only these edges which are actually changing over time. And I guess that's a bit similar to how you do MPEG motion encoding, you're looking for you're looking for changes over time. So we can actually also enforce that the image we reconstruct is actually sparse in this domain. We want to have as few non-zero entries as possible. So we effectively add this temporal uh, uh, sparsity gradient as another term. So here we minimize the L1 norm of the temporal gradient, but at the same time we're forcing the data to be uh, close to our measurements. So let me show you an example of how this looks like in practice. Um, so I'll show you the movie a couple of times because it actually runs quite quick. So what you see here at the, at the top is a fully sampled image. Uh, so this is how the original data looks like. Here you see the, 
the uh, result you get by applying the naive uh, zero filling. So I basically set every, every bit of data uh, to zero, which I have measured. This is our reconstruction, and this is the difference between the reconstruction and the, and the true measurement. And this is probably our nearest competitor called the KT focus algorithm, which uses wavelet uh, uh, transforms. And then here at the top, you see different, different sampling rates. So let me just show you this again. So in the beginning, we are sort of undersampling by a factor of 0.4. So we're still using quite a lot of the data. And you can actually see that the reconstructed image looks pretty good. Here, we're using only a fourth of the of the, of the case-based measurements. And actually, a reconstructed image still looks pretty good. And you see that even for quite high undersampling rates, the original data, basically, this is where we start with, looks almost unusable and looks really uh, uh, completely unusable. And uh, you see that the reconstruction now degrades as well, but it still actually gives you a, a reasonable image uh, and here at 5%, uh, you can see it breaks down and doesn't really give you any more sensible image. Yeah. Yes. Using only, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So if I, if I undersample by, 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 the, by 0.1, so I basically use only 10% of the measurements uh, I would normally use. Well, the, the, these ones not so much. These ones are qu these ones are quite flexible because I'm basically assuming I'm collecting a line. There are some of these measurements where basically you say I'm, I'm collecting single points in case, but which is not really feasible to do in in in. Yeah, as long as it's lines, it's actually very easy to actually implement. Yeah, I mean. Sorry. So, uh, so, so we do we actually. So the so the dictionaries are done in in reconstructed space, so in spatial domain. So the dictionary is not defined in in the Fourier representation. So I'm basically learning the dictionary on the on the reconstructed image, and I'm in the spatial domain. So I, I'm not I'm not quite sure how I would. Well, I mean, the, the thing which, of course, I saw, which I saw uh, yesterday is, of course, the thing is, so what we haven't done is we, for example, our dictionary, we don't s treat space and time separately, except that we have the temporal gradients. And what I saw yesterday was a quite neat approach for actually separating the two. So I think you can actually perhaps use more knowledge about that. You're effectively here, we're just treating it as a 3D element. And we know that two dimensions are space and the third one is time. Yes, yes. So and I guess the. Uh, they're not exchangeable. And the other thing is, of course, actually, um, there are some strategies in how you should actually randomly choose your, your uh, undersampling because you need to make sure that it's inconsistent with, with the data you're trying to collect. Yeah. So, but I know one of the ideas is, for example, you know. Can you actually perhaps go beyond this and actually reconstruct actually directly perhaps a segmented image or, or something which is even sparser uh, uh, like that? Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll switch the topic slightly and show you something about segmentation. And you'll see some patch based stuff coming back uh, in that as well. Uh, because it seems everybody is doing it at the moment. Um, so I guess all of you are very familiar with. With, reg uh, with segmentation. And one way of solving registration, which people have been using for a long, long time, is to simply treat the segmentation problem as a registration problem. So I have an atlas, and I, you guys have been doing this for ages, uh, and you have pioneered this, and it really works well. You take your atlas, you take your new image, you register the atlas to the new image, and you get a segmentation. And actually, 
It works uh, pretty well if you uh, use different registration algorithms, LDDMM or, uh, or B-splines. You can see, actually, even if your images are quite dissimilar, like in this particular case, you see the initial configuration of this brain looks really quite different to the configuration of that brain. But if you have a powerful enough uh, registration algorithm, you can actually match quite different looking brains. Now, if you do that, if you compare a manual segmentation with an automatic one, you see actually, no matter, I would postulate, no matter what algorithm you use, even the best one will give you a headache in terms of, it will create some errors. So you'll have A, registration errors, you'll have labeling errors. So uh, in your atlas. In, um, so if you compare the manual segmentation to the automatic one, on first inspection, it looks pretty good, but it's actually quite hard to uh, get to work really robustly. So there are a couple of different ways in how you could perhaps make this more, uh, more robust. And one of the ideas uh, which a couple of people uh, in our group had is to actually, why don't we use multiple atlases and use a very old idea from machine learning. So let's assume I have lots of labeled brains and we have uh, some data which is publicly available and you can actually download. Uh, by an expert observer, uh, manually uh, annotated uh, 30, 30 brains into 83 anatomical regions. And if you, if you have such a data set, you can take all your atlases and you can now just repeat the same process just 30 times. Just, and if you have a fast enough algorithm and enough compute power, that's actually not a problem at all. So you do the same process I showed you earlier 30 times and you end up with 30 different answers. Or on average, you probably end up with the same answer, but if you closely look, there will be substantial differences. And the differences come because every atlas represents a different anatomy, so it might be easier or more difficult to register. The human observer has made some labeling error in the atlas, and your registration makes some, some error. So you have a number of different sources. And one simple idea is to actually simply aggregate basically treat them all as outputs of a classifier and then apply decision fusion or classifier fusion um, to basically combine them into a consensus segmentation. And when we did this first, we used a very simple rule, this majority vote rule, but, so, but basically at every voxel, you look for how many atlases vote for what label, and then you just pick the maximum. So it's a ba basically like whatever the US or the English voting systems first past the post. And actually, works reliably, at least in atlas selection, and this works quite reliably. I'm not sure it really works very well in a voting system. But, uh, but and they are, mo they are much more sophisticated algorithms, so Simon Warfield does this with staple as a, as, a, as a way of fusing the segmentations. You can do this weighted, and lots of different ways. But one of the key observations is you actually need fairly few atlases to get a quite rapid increase in performance. So. If you use only 10 atlases, you get a substantial improvement. This is over 83 structures, just computing the average value uh, in terms of overlap. Uh, you see a massive improvement. The only thing you then see is that actually after a while, you get this sort of tail. And that's, um, you know, from our point of view, quite uh, not very nice. From a clinician's or from if you talk to your uh, manual raters, they're quite happy because they say, I don't need to label more than 20 brains. There's no point. You don't get any improvement anyway. Um, and, that's, and that's actually not quite true. So when we did some initial experiments, because we're sort of a bit frustrated that we couldn't get better than that, we had some collaboration where uh, with people actually, um, uh, David Kennedy at a MGH, um, who had actually, I think, he has an army of students locked up in some cave where they segment brains, uh, brain after brain, and they gave us 300 labeled brains. Uh, you know, and they say, and they are, they, you know, they are labeled not only into one or two structures; they're labeled into, I think, uh, 24 structures. So it's a lot of work, and a lot of student work. Um, and so we decided, that, you know, our our approach wouldn't be really scalable. So what we do is. We do a simplified approach, but we try to see can we actually beat the current system. And so, the idea is you take your 200 or your 300 brains, you register them all to some sort of brain standard atlas, uh, MNI or whatever you want to use, uh, just with an affine registration quite coarsely, and then you get your unseen data, 
Uh, you also registered affinely to this space, and then you can actually compare which atlas looks similar to the brain you're trying to segment. So here you can actually just use whatever similarity measure you normally use in registration, and you can decide this one doesn't look similar, this one looks similar, this one looks similar, this one looks similar. And then after you have, let's say, taken your top 20 atlases, you can then perform your non-rigid registration to your unseen data set, and uh, you can now repeat exactly the same process as before. Um, uh, you know, and, and actually that works remarkably well, but it, and actually here, here's some sort of uh, uh, curves for how well it actually works. Um, so what we do here is effectively the blue curve is the curve where we select the top N atlases, uh, and the green curve is basically one where we just randomly select n atlases. So you will see that if I would plot this to 300, both of these curves would meet because we're using the same 300 atlases. But in the blue one, I'm just using the, the most similar ones. And you see that actually you have this sweet spot here where you get a rapid improvement because you're, sol you're selecting multiple similar atlases. And then at some point, you're starting to add atlases which are actually not helpful. They actually look more dissimilar. and they, they degrade your performance. So, so that was quite quite nice. But we then, yeah. So the blue lines is that the number of similar atlases used, or that's the number? Yeah. So basically, this here is the atl number of atlases I'm using, and in the green curve, I'm just using them randomly. I just pick randomly 20 atlases, and in the blue curve, I pick. Large database, but exactly. I have 300 of them. So if I plot this to, to 300, they will all meet because I'm using the same 300. Do you have different metrics for similar? Just say similar. For example, we have used, in this work, we used, I think, mutual information, normalized mutual information. Yeah, we use cross-correlation, whatever. I mean, I don't think we got really drastically different results for different, yeah. Um, but then we ended up with this problem and saying, actually, what do we do if uh, we have a new data set? Uh, we can't just ask somebody to go and segment 300 brains uh, or 300 knees or cards or whatever you want to use. So in theory, I mean, so this is actually from a practical point of view, not a very useful result, except that it tells you it really makes a difference which ones you choose. So we ended up with this problem where we're trying to, for example, segment all the ADNI data sets which are sort of an elderly population with our 30 atlases, which are all from relatively young individuals. So they don't look very similar. So I'll show you how we try to sort of solve this. So, so in theory, this works very well. But in an ideal world, you would basically generate your atlases always in a new. Uh, and then the number of atlases is, is limited in terms of uh, uh, time, manpower, whatever. So the question we had is, is there a way of sort of bootstrapping this? And here I'm going to sort of use an idea which some of you will be very familiar with, is to basically try to m model a manifold of all these, uh, these images which I have. Um, and for those of you who, have, who are familiar with this, you'll all have seen a Swiss roll many, many times. So the idea is you have, some high, you have an object in a high dimensional space and actually all the samples of that object or of the class of object lie on a lower dimensional space. And if you can find that, you can, for example, cluster your data. And the nice thing about this is you can, you can rearrange your data so that similar looking images will be close together, which is not the case in, in if I use the Euclidean distance in this space, I have a problem because the red points will look actually in terms of Euclidean distance quite close to the, to the blue points. If I've learned the manifold and sort of unrolled this, actually, I can use the Euclidean distance as a reasonable approximation to the, to the geodesic distance. And there are many different algorithms for doing this. We just chose one particular one. I don't want to say it's the best one, because I couldn't claim it. It basically uses something called Laplacian eigenmaps, which is basic idea is you treat the problem of finding this manifold as, uh, uh, as sort of basically uh, you're trying to uh, learn a similar, or you have a similarity matrix, all your images correspond to a graph, and the edge weights between uh, images correspond to the similarity. Do you then typically sparsify the graph because your, your long-range distances are unreliable, 
and then you can unroll, you can basically discover the manifold structure and sort of uh, effectively perform dimensionality reduction. The way this works with Laplacian eigenmaps is you, uh, as I said before, you treat it as a graph, you compute this, uh, this uh, diagonal matrix T, which uh, contains a degree sum, basically tells you how much of an outlier an image is. You then compute the normalized graph Laplacian, and then you can compute the eigenvectors uh, of that, and that effectively solves an energy minimization problem. And the problem it tries to minimize is this one here. I'm basically trying to find a mapping into a lower dimensional space where points which have a high degree of similarity are close together. So points where Wij is high are uh, supposed to be close together. And uh, if Wij is close to zero, I don't really care how far I uh, have them apart. And of course, I need to learn a similarity matrix for this. So the way we do this is, for example, in the case of if we try to segment the hippocampus, we have a mask and <clears throat> in a standard space, and we compute the similarity only in the region of the hippocampus. And here's an example which shows you how all the population of ADNI would be clustered if you just reduce this to two dimensions. Now, I'm only choosing two dimensions because that's the only thing um, I can show here. So you can use more than two dimensions. So you see the AD subjects are more on this side. The MCI subjects are sort of scattered all over. The, the controls are scattered here. And for those of you who can't see it, our 30 atlases from the young controls are sort of effectively outliers on this side of the population. And that's not entirely surprising because they really look a bit systematically different because they're young, healthy subjects. And so we basically know that if I try to register this atlas to this subject on the other side, I'll have a very hard time, even with Sarang's algorithm. It will be really hard to do. Um, so the idea we thought is, well, why don't we make the problem easier and actually first try to actually label these brains here. So the idea is basically, I'm starting with a set of labeled brains for which I know uh, the ground truth segmentation. I select the nearest one in my manifold, and then I basically do this multi-atlas segmentation. So I basically propagate the information from the labeled brains to the unlabeled brains, but only in the, in the neighborhood. Then I get a larger, uh, larger uh, set of atlases, and then I keep on propagating the information through the manifold until I've reached the other side of the manifold. And then many of you might say, actually, if you do that, you'll accumulate errors, and that's true you actually accumulate the errors uh, quite substantially. So what we try to do is basically have a refinement step which tries to limit the uh, amount of error accumulation by effectively performing an intensity-based classification step every time we do this using this graph cuts algorithm, or you can use expectation maximization depending on what you want to do. And the sort of the final result here really is just that if you do this, if you, if you start off with your atlases, um, and you'd use your population, if you actually look at the, the set of, uh, let me just show you this, the set of atl uh, subjects which are close to the atlases, you get a pretty good hippocampal segmentation of nearly 0.87 or so in terms of dice overlap. But also if you go to the other side of the manifold, if I look at the completely opposite spectrum, so these are the ones which are look quite si dissimilar to the atlases, if you look at the last column here, which is this proposed uh, segmentation framework, you basically see that as you go through the manifold, you basically keep on, you keep your segmentation performance without degrading it. So actually, you're doing a pretty good job at, um, at uh, maintaining that bit of information. Okay, so um, let me just skip a couple of slides and show you um, some more results on how you can actually do this because we thought about this actually. Let's see, um, I go to this topic of biomarker discoveries. Do we actually need to segment these brains at all? Do we actually really need to bother about segmenting uh, a structure like the hippocampus? So if I, if I do a really good segmentation of the hippocampus, if I look at baseline classification, I'm not doing a fantastic job, but I just have to live with the fact that hippocampal volume on its own is not going to give me a perfect group separation, for example. I'm using here all ADNI subjects, um, the baseline images only. 
And of course, if I, use a, if I measure atrophy or if I do a 4D segmentation uh, using, for example, 4D graph cuts, if I segment two time points, I can actually improve that by actually getting a better segmentation performance uh, here. But the other thing, I, I've already learned this manifold which I've just shown you. Could I not use the manifold directly to actually classify whether a subject is AD, MCI, or, or whatever? And then you look at the results and actually you say, no, actually, if I wanted to try to classify, separate the blue ones from the red ones, obviously it doesn't work. Right? You clearly see that um, you cannot, I mean, you probably could separate it a bit better in five dimensions or whatever, but it doesn't really work well. But the thing which I guess also a lot of you have actually uh, been working on is if you use longitudinal information, if you track every subject as it moves through the manifold, you can basically use the manifold coordinates, but also the change in manifold coordinates as a classif classification feature. And you can here now see that actually the red subjects, the controls, they stay much more static, they move much less. The blue subjects start off here, but they move much more in this direction. No, so these are the, the first dimension of my manifold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there, it doesn't have any intrinsic meaning associated with it. Yeah. Well, I can only interpret that. I know that the blue subjects, they probably, the brain changes more. So they move further apart in the manifold. They have to, they have to, so if, if you would have two, I mean, like this, this brain, for example, it probably hasn't changed at all because it, um, it'd be exactly, and it's an, exactly at the same location in the manifold. So, but this gets to this issue. I mean, you could have quantified, for instance, Yeah, I mean, actually, so but actually, the, the, yes. So what I've, is the manifold? Because we struggle with this, you know. I mean, we work with it. So what is the manifold giving you? Because you wouldn't get it just by saying, I'm going to put Man, you're looking at distance on the manifold. Using the manifold. Yes. Why not some metric directly on the manifold? I guess you could do that. I mean, the, the question is whether um, if you can really reliably compute your metric for for data points which are quite dissimilar. Yeah. So, so, if, so I, I get. I mean, I don't think that. Yeah. I mean, if you could actually in a perfect setting, I think you probably get the same results. So I can I don't even I, I this actually doesn't use deformation. This uses intensity. I can I can. How do you know where you're on the manifold? No 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 I I no no I don't. Yeah yeah. I mean I can I can use that. I mean we have tried this with deformations. Yeah yeah. So, so actually, this is a really naive. Of, I mean, this is really naive. Yeah. I'm, I'm not putting anything. I'm just actually the only thing I'm doing is I'm limiting it to the hippocampal region. Right. So, uh, but I've done this in a in a sort of normalized in M and I space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. Yeah, but I mean, the whole brain you will, the larger the ventricles will dominate everything. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, yeah, we tried this. Doesn't give you any result at all. Yeah, so I mean, actually, you need to really restrict it to the hippocampus. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But for example, if you then, so this is again, as I said, this is using. I think at that time we only had 360 subjects, but and you're just trying to classify on manifold coordinates. Um, so it's really naive in a sense. That it's only L2 distance. Nothing no segmentation involved, and you actually get quite good results. I mean, no deformation. I'm sure you, if you can do the deformation really well, you probably get better results. I mean, I, I, I'm not advocating that you shouldn't do deformation. I'm just saying you probably, in this case, can get away with doing very little of that. And the other thing which we then thought about is, in this manifold learning framework, can you add extra information, non-imaging information? 
And just remember that really what you're doing is when you're doing Laplacian eigenmaps is you construct this graph. And one thing you can, for example, do is you can ex add extra, extra nodes to your graph. And you can link, for example, uh, for example, if you have APOE genotype, there are four different APOE uh, uh, genotypes. You add four different nodes, and then you connect those subjects which have that genotype to that node, and not the other ones. And then you effectively, in your, your manifold cost function, just gets an extra term, but you can actually solve that very, very easily. Uh, and the effect it really has, for example, if you, if you look, for example, just again at, at two dimensions, um, if you don't use the genotype, you sort of fair, you, well, you can see the, the blue subjects are more on this side, the, the yellow, red ones are more on this side. I think the color here indicates, I think, their MMSE score. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but you see that actually if you add genotype information, you're basically pulling the data points apart by adding extra information which you didn't have before, and you're forcing uh, uh, points to move uh, uh, further apart in the map. And so this uses only baseline data. And again, you actually now get reasonably um, good, uh, uh, depending on whether you use uh, APOE, uh, a CSF measurement, or hippocampal volume as an extra node in this graph. So what? EMCI progressive? progressive MCI and stable MCI. So converters and non-converters. So I mean, uh, yeah. at that, that time we well, at that time we used P and L, and now we we use uh, C and NC. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'll probably. Uh, just show you one last example, and then I'll stop because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, we also try to uh, think about how do we combine these, uh, uh, for example, multimodal data sets, like uh, we don't have only a small number of features, but high dimensional features like uh, uh, PET imaging and MR imaging. And like a lot of people also here, we have been playing around with random forests as a classifier or a classification for us, because we've been told by some people that we shouldn't use the term random for us, you should really call them classification for us. And what we do is basically we learn that we take the original image uh, features, uh, voxel-wise or regional values, we put them through a, a classification for us, and one of the nice things is that in a classification for us, you can actually derive a similarity matrix between data points be, by simply looking at how many times does a subject um, end up in the same leaf node in this classification forest. So what you effectively end up with is uh, similarity matrices um, for different features. For example, I think the top one here is, um, is CSF, this is FDG PET, this is MRI, and this is the APOE genotype, so that's very sort of binary data. But you can then actually use these similarity matrices you derive from a classifier. So these are supervised uh, similarity matrices to actually um, try to learn a manifold uh, from these similarity matrices by combining these different classifiers. And actually, again, it turns out that actually you can get quite nice results with doing that. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, so I probably should stop here and just go to some... Um, sort of uh, acknowledgements. So we're doing lots of other things which I haven't shown you, but more importantly, we have done a, a lot of people in our group have, have um, helped prepare the slides I showed you today. Uh, a lot of the work on, on the adult brains uh, has been funded as a European uh, project called Predict ID, looking at Alzheimer's disease. And then these are the people who have given us uh, money for, for the research. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer the questions. Thank you very much. So we actually have now done uh, the first, so, so one of the problems we often had with cardiac images is that we didn't have enough atlases to really 
start playing with. So we have now actually started uh, uh, generating a larger database of, of atlases. And we have also started now applying basically the same ideas of this uh, multi-atlas segmentation to cardiac data sets. It works almost as good as uh, in the neuro case, but I think if you look at the heart, there is actually, there are some other challenges. So there is, in, in some sense, I think the anatomical variability is larger than in the brain. So if you look, for example, at the right ventricle, you actually need larger atlas databases. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is often you have, for example, your, your standard acquisitions often have very anisotropic image resolution, so thick slices. So it actually gets more difficult. So, but in principle, I think I'm pretty confident that we will get this to work uh, in the, uh, within the sort of fairly near future. And if I would actually tell a grad student if they want to do cardiac image segmentation, I would basically try to pursue a direction in this in this direction, because I think actually I think in the brain, can, you know, so we have there's some stuff which I haven't shown where we now use also combine this a bit with this. A lot of you know these patch-based techniques, um, which basically relax the rela relax the requirements on how good your registration need to be. And if you combine these patch-based techniques with the atlas-based techniques, I think it will work for the cardiac case. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Well, I'm not sure because if you really go for these patch-based techniques, the patch-based techniques basically just say I need to find some patch in the image which in my atlas, which looks similar to the patch I have here. It doesn't really make global topological sort of considerations. So perhaps if you use some of those approaches, you can actually relax this, because I agree. I mean, otherwise, for example, in the case of Atria, you need a huge number of, uh, of different ones. I don't think that would be feasible. Yes, sir. I mean, that, that's a, for, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, for example, when we now think about cardiac, accelerating cardiac imaging, if you really think about this, what they want to measure is ejection fraction. Now, you, what you really think about, now you're collecting 10 minutes of data, of, of this case-based data, you reconstruct a really high-dimensional data set, and then you reduce it down to one number. You should be able to get that one number with much less data. So. I agree. Actually, I think. No, I, 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 I sort of, I'm sort of over exaggerating, but I think also, I, I think what what Sarang and I try to say is, is perhaps only true for one category of problems where you don't really care about spatial localization. For example, if you really want to know where something is, is wrong, then you really, you need to basically resolve it spatially. And then actually you need to get much more data. But if you, let's say, if you want to just make a fairly rough categorization. Um, but I think it's sort of, I think the general principle which we're trying to follow is basically, in the past, what you really aim to do is you try to reconstruct the best quality image for a human observer. That might not be the best yeah. image for an algorithm. And if you could actually get away with, with I mean, of course, the problem is if you, if you don't reconstruct an image for a human observer, the human observer really needs to trust the algorithm that what it 
But if you could, let's say you could solve that problem, you can probably, I think, reconstruct images which are better suited for automatic processing than we do at the moment. And I guess that's where we sort of in the long term want to go to. Exactly. But for example, you know, if you, for example, do perfusion imaging, you always do first your standard short axis imaging. So you effectively know the geometry of the heart. Now, actually, in the second sequence, you're collecting that data over, I mean, in some other form over and over again. Or let's say you have a pa patient with Alzheimer's. The hippocampus is shrinking a bit, but the rest of the brain you basically know beforehand how the brain will look like. It might be in a different spatial position, but uh, can you, know, you must be able to accelerate the acquisition in some sense. Guido? <coughs> No. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean I think uh, I think that what sort of I, I think you know we're reaching perhaps a point which also the computer vision community has reached that they're obsessed by some sort of benchmark. For example, if you know computer vision, if you do anything with optical flow or so, unless you use a Middlebury or some other standard database, you cannot publish your paper. And I think the same is true if you have an ADNI paper, unless you show classification rate. However, I agree, completely agree with you that from a clinical point of view, or from, let's say, for how you would use this in practice, that's not what you want to do. So, for example, what we do is a lot of clinical trials, and there the question is, for example, what you often, what a, what a, if you're in a clinical trial, you want to enroll as many patients as possible, which, for example, which are at the MCI, the, the MCI stage, which will convert to Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you have a lot of subjects which don't convert, they make your trial much bigger and much more expensive, and they reduce your statistical power. So if you could, for example, select patients for inclusion into a clinical trial, which you know will convert, you'll, you'll be able to run the clinical trial with fewer subjects. That's, for example, one application. The other application where, for example, um, there are some currently some Alzheimer's drugs which are in trial, which are probably all fail. But the ones, if, if, there is, if there is a likelihood that one of them will succeed, it's very likely that it will probably only succeed in a subset of the population and that you will need to use imaging as part of the prescription to actually be able to say what... Yes. 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 I agree. Yes, I mean, you can, you can basically... I mean, does it, does it work with, obviously, the movement is a problem. Um, so, so you can, of course, you mean in these babies. So we have done a resting state fMRI in these babies. You can clearly not, or in, this feet, in, in the fetus, you can't do contrast. Uh, well, you can actually do, because you can, for example, use uh, audio stimulus. Or, you know, you, so you can, 
in some sense. And for example, in preterm infants, when they're born, we have sort of, for example, robotic devices, which, for example, you can stimulate their, t their grasp reflex or so. You can do some of these things. But I mean, if you look at there are there are a couple of really high profile papers in PNAS or so on looking at resting state uh, fMRI in, in these infants, uh, either in the fetus or in the fetus, I, I haven't seen anything which which I would say is actually really a, a credible. I mean, people have done basically proof of concept things, but not really from a neuroscience point of view. But I think it's perhaps just a, a question of time when people will be able to do that. Yes. Exactly, and you know, people also have ideas that you know the current, the, the standard fMRI is all based on on bolt uh, on the bolt effect. Um, there are some ideas that, for example, in the in in the fetus, the T2, uh, the T1 and T2 times are really quite different. That you might be able to, for example, use something like T2 star imaging to actually show activation in the brain. So you can actually, which you couldn't do in the adult, but uh, so there are some ideas of of using different to conventional fMRI type uh, imaging acquisition strategies. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Even better. So you come around this one very quickly. Of course. Yes. It was just a question of time. 